All right, Amy, take it away. Thank you, Alyssa. Hello, and welcome to the Hirschberg Foundation for Pancreat Pancreatic Cancer Research Webinar, Chemotherapy for Pancreatic Cancer Patients, Less is More. My name is Amy Brees, and I am the Patient and Family Support Coordinator for the Hirschberg Foundation. Maggie Hirschberg, our founder, is here too, and looks forward to saying hi at the end of the webinar. First, I'd like to acknowledge all of our wonderful sponsors who help make these webinars possible, including Celgene, Novacure, and Fibrogen. Please ask your questions either during or after the slide presentation by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of the screen and type and submit your question. We will open the discussion for all after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website, pancreatic.org. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. William H. Isakoff, a renowned oncologist who leads the Pancreatic Cancer Treatment Center of Los Angeles. For more than three decades, Dr. Isakoff has earned a reputation as one of the foremost gastrointestinal oncologists within the United States and has developed innovative treatments which have significantly extended the lives of pancreatic patients throughout the country. Dr. Isakoff's focus is on the development of newer, more effective, and less toxic treatments for patients with pancreatic cancer. By using low-dose metronomic chemotherapy without radiation, Dr. Isakoff and the pancreatic surgical team at UCLA have downstaged more than 60 patients who at the time of initial diagnosis were felt to be inoperable, and who after successful treatment were then able to become surgical candidates. Thank you, Dr. Isakoff, for joining us today. Um, and it looks like you're muted right now, so we just need audio. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 <laughs> Welcome. Good. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the Hirschberg Foundation for inviting me to participate in this webinar so I can share some of my uh, perspective regarding pancreatic cancer. I also want to congratulate the Hirschberg Foundation and Aggie for 23 years of hard work. The foundation was founded in honor of uh, Ronnie Hirschberg, uh, who I had the pleasure of knowing, but sadly he passed of pancreatic cancer when he was 54. He was a great humanitarian, but he also liked to have fun. And he lived by the motto, uh, the one who has the most toys wins. And that truly was Ronnie who loved life. Uh, since the founding of the Hirschberg Foundation, Aggie and her team have raised huge amounts of money, and the foundation has funded renowned scientists throughout the United States and has also helped countless patients get to the right place for their treatment. So I'm very happy to be here today and share with you some of my thoughts. I want to start by uh, a few minutes talking about what pancreatic cancer is um, and where it starts. During today's conversation, we're going to focus on ductal adenocarcinoma. So the pancreas has a uh, system of ducts uh, and it's in the lining of these ducts that the cancer starts. This represents 90% of all pancreatic tumors. Other tumors that arise in the pancreas are neuroendocrine tumors, uh, lymphomas, and sarcomas, and a number of tumors spread outside the pancreas and metastasize to it. And they would include lung cancer, breast cancer, and kidney cancer. Today we're focusing on ductal 
adenocarcinoma. 90% uh, of these tumors arise randomly or sporadically. And about 10% do have a familial uh, background, either uh, strong family history or genetic mutations that would predispose uh, the individual patient for developing pancreatic cancer. Um, this morning, driving to work, I was listening to Dr. Fauci talk about how we're going to deal with coronavirus. And I was upset. And the reason was he was not direct enough. So I promise today I will be very direct and brutally honest. Um, as far as background is concerned, the majority of patients with a ductal adenocarcinoma of the pancreas who have incurable disease and are placed on chemotherapy will have progression within the first year of treatment. Um, sadly, in my opinion, the prognosis for patients who have metastatic ductal adenocarcinoma has not significantly improved in the last 20 years. And that's in spite of new drug development, uh, our ability to sequence genes and look for mu uh, genetic mutations, uh, and new combination of treatments, including uh, immunotherapy. Uh, I know oncologists out there will, um, if you will, be excited about the advancements we've made, but once we dissect them and truly understand their impact, I'm not sh so sure that the excitement is warranted. Uh, in the way of background regarding treatment, uh, the first quote, significant advance was made in 1997 when GEMSAR or gemcitabine was FDA approved. And people thought that this was a major accomplishment. We can, I'll tell you when to go forward. Go back. Okay. Uh, so gemcitabine was used as a single agent uh, it was compared to 5-FU, and in that pivotal trial, uh, or because of it, the FDA approved gemcitabine. In reality, there were no objective parameters that uh, showed that gemcitabine was any better than 5-FU. They actually looked at subjective symptoms in two groups of patients, the 100 some odd patients getting 5-FU and those getting gemcitabine. And there was subjective improvement in the quality of life in people receiving gemcitabine, primarily a benefit in how they controlled their pain. The study was criticized because it was the first time that they used subjective parameters to evaluate the activity of a drug. However, if you looked at objective parameters, there was minimal improvement in um, in median survival. And when you looked at the uh, object objective shrinkage, and this I'm reading from the package insert, uh, from gemcitabine. There were no confirmed objective tumor responses with either therapy. However, because on improvement in quality of life, the FDA approved the drug. And basically, uh, in all trials since, the median survival from gemcitabine is usually six months or less. 
uh, the next regimen that appeared to make some improvement was the combination of gemcitabine and uh, abraxane. Uh, in this trial, uh, the two drugs demonstrated a significant improvement in overall survival, but it was very short, roughly 1.7 months. Uh, however, the toxicity was real. And about 50% of the patients had to come off trial within the first four months because of disease progression or toxicity. So again, keep in mind that you're treating a serious disease, potentially life-threatening, and most of the patients could not tolerate the treatment for more than four months. The next effective regimen that uh, is part of standard of care is Fulfurinox. It's a four drug combination that was developed by the French. What they basically did was take two regimens used in colon cancer and put them together. One was Fulfox or 5-FU, leucoborn oxaliplatinum, and the other was Fulfury, 5-FU, leucoborn areno tecan. And they put these two regimens together to give you 5-FU, leucoborn oxaliplatinum, areno tecan, and they had 200 patients receiving Fulfurinox compared to 200 patients receiving gemcitabine, and there was a clear statistical improvement in overall survival. Patients in the gemcitabine group had a median survival of a little over seven months, and the patients receiving Fulfurinox had a median survival of about 11 and a half months. However, in the four drug combination, toxicity was, in my opinion, unacceptable, and we'll get there in a little while. So, uh, in summary, the regimens that have been used, used one, two, or three drugs uh, at the highest possible dose, what they call maximally tolerated dose. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so what happens when you use any treatment at the maximally tolerated dose? One, it limits the number of drugs that you can use, because if I decided I wanted to use five drugs, at the maximally tolerated dose, everyone would be in the hospital with unacceptable side effects. It prolongs the time interval between doses so that patients can recover from the side effects. It's usually too toxic for a significant number of patients. And the, in the original Fulfurinox trial, there were limitations on patients' eligibility. Uh, patients older than 65 were not admitted to the trial because they feared it would be too toxic. And patients with a poor performance status also were found to be ineligible because again, they felt the treatment would be too toxic. Uh, in addition, uh, almost half the patient required growth factors, either Neupogen or Nulasta, to support white cell production from their bone marrow. And overall, most patients would feel or tell you that it's not a very patient-friendly regimen. Next slide. So here's a, uh, a bit of a summary uh, using uh, or, 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 or uh, elucidating two of the trials that I mentioned. One was GEM 
cytabine compared to uh, abraxane or nav paclitaxel and gemcitabine. The other gemcitabine compared to fulfurinox. You can see overall survival in the experimental arms were eight and a half and 11 months pers uh, respectively. We just analyzed 65 patients getting metronomic dosing of 5-FU, leucovorn, abraxane, oxaliplatinum, and bevacizumab, which we'll talk about later. And we had a median survival of 19 months. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So looking at standard fulfurinox, in summary, the response rate's about 30%. The overall median, median, median survival is 11 months. Two-year survival is under 10%. And the number of days on treatment is less than four months. So let me ask. If you were designing a regimen for pancreatic cancer, would you design a regimen, again, with significant number of patients having to stop treatment in less than four months uh, because of uh, toxic side effects? Some people are faced with the dilemma that they're responding to treatment, but they have unacceptable toxicity and they have to come off therapy uh, to go on second line therapy, which probably won't be as good. And when, again, you look at the uh, survival rates at 6, 12, 18, and 24 months, the one year survival is under 50% and the two-year survival is under 10%. Next slide. With standard fulfurinox, uh, the grade three or four toxicities include neutropenia, fatigue, vomiting, diarrhea, neuropathy. Uh, this is compared to the regimen I spoke to uh, using metronomic dosing. Um, the difference is that the patients who were on fulfurinox were on it for four months. The patients getting the metronomic regimen were able to tolerate it for more than six months. So when you look at the cumulative toxicity, the time on therapy was significantly longer in the metronomic dose schedule. Next slide. So what have we learned? Um, one, fulfurinox is a difficult regimen. Uh, when you look at the National Comprehensive Cancer Guidelines, uh, and they recommend gemcitabine and abraxane or fulfurinox. The truth is no one uses fulfurinox. So no one is following the guidelines. The only trial that used fulfurinox was the original trial. If you look at data collected in the United States by some of our leading cancer institutions like the Mayo Clinic. Within the first cycle of therapy, 50% of the patients are getting modified doses, or 50% of the patients are getting regimens that leave out one of the chemotherapeutic drugs. So the question is, what's a guideline? A guideline should be the drugs, the dose, and the schedule. Well, if by the first cycle, more than 25% of the patients are not getting what's recommended in the published literature, and the doses are being modified because the doctors treating them know they're not gonna tolerate the full dose, 
are they really following the guidelines? So the Fulfurinox, as it was originally used by the French, basically were only reserved for very fit patients. Um, the criteria for getting on the trial and being eligible were very stringent and they truly don't meet what we see in the real world. Uh, for example, patients that don't have a high performance status would not be put on fulfurinox. Patients who are elderly above 75 would not be put on fulfurinox. Uh, because of the time interval between the doses, and a lot of times it's more than two weeks because the patient still hasn't fully recovered. The patients develop early drug resistance. And if you look at some of the prospective trials done in the United States after Fulfurinox was recommended, more than 50% of the patients require growth factors. Growth factors are not such a good thing, which I'll comment on. And then it's also a very expensive regimen. Why? Half the patients are getting growth factors. I know at UCLA, if you get Nulasta, one dose is more than $4,000. Uh, and there are doctors that give a dose with each cycle. Uh, and that Again, in a lot of the trials reported since the original uh, Fulfurinox uh, trial, uh, as many as 35 to 40 percent of the patients are hospitalized for neutropenic fever, adding to the expense. Okay, the next slide. So if you were going to design a trial, or if I were going to design a trial, uh, what would I want? Much higher response rates. Response rates to Fulfurinox, 30%. How about more than 50%? How about a survival of not 10%, but more than 50% of two years? And how about make it safe? You know, we graduated medical school, Somewhere along the line, they said, do no harm. Well, every patient getting Fulfurinox suffers serious toxicity, uh, which I would say is not helping them lead a better quality of life. We need something that's less expensive, and we need something where all patients, poor performance status and elderly patients, can be treated. Next slide. So what is metronomic chemotherapy? Basically, it's using the same drugs, conventional chemotherapy, okay? But as I said before, I'd like to use four or five drugs. And instead of giving it infrequently, I would like to give it frequently. However, if I gave five drugs frequently at the highest possible dose, every patient would be in the hospital with serious side effects. If you believe, as I do, that the number of drugs and the frequency is the most important, there's only one way to give lots of drugs frequently, lower all the doses. When you do that, the target of treatment shifts from trying to kill cancer cells by its cytotoxic effect to preventing new vascularization. Well, now the target is angiogenesis. Prevent the cancer cells or the tumor from making new blood vessels. Uh, let me just see one thing. Okay. Next slide. So now we have a shift. 
and it's away from killing cancer cells to preventing angiogenesis. So when you give 5-FU at very, very, very low non-toxic doses, you may have some cytotoxic effect, but what you're doing is you have an anti-angiogenic effect. And how does this work? <laughs> the bone marrow is not only making red cells, white cells, and platelets, it's also making what we call endothelial progenitor cells. These endothelial progenitor cells go to the cancer and help them make new blood vessels. When you give low doses of what may seem to be ineffective chemotherapy, you're inhibiting the bone marrow from making these endothelial cells and you prevent them from being released from the bone marrow. As a result, if you give low doses of non-toxic 5-FU with an anti-VEGF or anti-angiogenic inhibitor like Tevacizumab, the two are synergistic. So VEGF is vascular endothelial growth factor. It's a factor made by the cancer that promotes angiogenesis. Bevacizumab targets the growth factor and prevents it from working. So when you inhibit VEGF and when you prevent the release of the endothelial progenitor cells from the bone marrow, there is synergy. It turns out that if you give low doses of conventional chemotherapy for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, kidney cancer, colon cancer, myeloma, and neuroendocrine tumor, they're all effective. I started using anti-angiogenic dosing in 1985 to treat colon cancer. <clears throat> We, at that time, had ambulatory pumps. I would give low doses of 5-FU, and this is what seemed difficult to do now, but back then, we were doing it. For 10 weeks, no, no breaks. Essentially, the toxicity was carrying the pump. So, uh, you can go back to the other slide. Um, so basically, we gave single-edging chemotherapy for 10 consecutive weeks to treat patients with colon cancer, and it was very effective. Um, I think, can you go back to the slide, the advantages? Yeah, okay, so the advantages, it's one, far less toxic. It is patient-friendly. It has fewer dose-limiting side effects. Patients can remain on it longer and overall save money. One, you don't use growth factors, and I mean a lot of money, and you'll prevent hospitalizations. The important aspect about patients remaining on it longer, I have patients that I'm still treating uh, for, there was one in my office yesterday, her name was Diane. And I started treating her in 19, in, in 2006, okay, so that's 14 years. There's no way anyone's gonna stay on Fulfurinox for 14 years. So the truth of the matter is, if you want chemotherapy to work, you have to give it in a way that patients can tolerate it and have to tolerate it for a prolonged period of time and not four or six months. You want them to be on it for one, two, or three years, okay? Uh, so they can, one, get the best advantage of having its anti-neoplastic effect, but two, have a good quality of life, and I mean leading a normal life. Uh, the patient in my office yesterday, Diane, is a producer of 
uh, national news on one of the major networks and she hasn't missed a day of work. And there are plenty of other patients just like her who continue to work, function in a normal way, have a normal performance status, and have effective chemotherapy. The next slide. So in the patients where we gave, where we looked at 65 consecutive patients on this uh, low dose metronomic chemotherapy, they all had pancreatic cancer, they all had measurable disease, they had no previous chemotherapy, they had almost any performance status, but they had to have adequate bone marrow function, adequate liver function, and adequate kidney function. You can skip the next slide, okay. And as an example of a metronomic protocol, uh, if we were going to use metronomic fulfurinox, we would give a 5-FU over two weeks. Oxaliplatinum at a dose that is less than one-third the standard dose, and the areno tecan that's less than one third the standard dose. What we did was use exactly the same thing, but we substituted the areno tecan and replaced it with a Braxane at a dose that was less than one third the recommended dose. So if you're going to give fulfurinox every other week, and you give three times the doses of oxaliplatinum and areno tecan, the dose is already in. If you divide the doses, you give 30 milligrams per meter squared of oxali on the first day. And if the patient tolerates it, you give it on the eighth day. And if the patient's in good shape, you give it on the 15th day. But if they're not in great shape, you avoid the third dose and you don't make the patient sick. So this is a trial we're proposing uh, in um, a, a couple of cooperative groups. One is SWOG and the other is uh, a PANCAN actually. Um, next slide. Next slide, okay. So if you compare the fulfurinox with the metronomic dosing that we did in 65 patients, uh, we just about doubled the 12 month survival. Uh, our survival at, let's just take two years, was four times greater than fulfurinox. But most importantly, no one got sick. And so I think for me, the way to treat patients with cancer is if you don't make them sick, use lower doses, give it more frequently, it actually works much better and patients can stay on it much longer. So I wanna thank you for your attention I want to thank once again Aggie and the Foundation for asking me to share some of this with you. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, should anyone have a question? Is it okay to ask verbally or is it okay to, um, uh, is, do we need to submit it via writing? No, no, you're, you're welcome to just ask, Dr. Zach. Great. Um, Dr. Isakoff, my dad uh, actually came to see you and uh, Boris Zach, and he is starting to get uh, for fear uh, therapy and having um, some secondary effects from uh, the uh, for fear such as with, like terrible diarrhea. He had, they, they put him on uh, on uh, IV or like to infuse them with uh, liquids. Um, I, I, a completely different question. Hopefully this is not like totally stupid. I'm not really familiar with it, but um, 
I read about a drug called Abraxane developed by Shung, Shun Shung uh, that helped uh, some people kind of like an immunotherapy drug. Would this be a, um, a drug that's possibly what he would be able to switch to uh, at this point, or is that not? What's the name of the drug? Abraxane. Can you repeat? Abraxane? Abraxane. 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 Yes. Yeah. Abraxane's a good drug. It's probably the best single agent. Uh, and it, it is a good option. The um, arenotecan is probably what's causing most of the diarrhea. And if you were able to uh, either eliminate it or lower the dose, uh, it would probably uh, be way more tolerable. Okay. But if they wanted to use a Braxane, that that's a good choice. The other option is to take the dose. Well, first of all, give him the treatment without a Renotecan, see how he does and then reinstitute the urinotecan at a much lower dose. But the switching to abraxane, abraxane at this point is not a good option? No, no. It's a very reasonable, I, I, I'm, I'm giving you two options. Yeah, yeah. One, okay. eliminate the urinotecan and then reintroduce it at a lower dose. Or another good option is to begin treatment with Abraxane, actually substitute the Abraxane for the arenotecan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. We have Gina is asking mm -hmm. a question. She'd like to ask a question. Hi. Thank you. I, I, my question actually was very similar to the gentleman's question that he asked about the Abraxane, um, you had mentioned substituting it instead of the Irina Tecan. But my concern for my husband, he's the one, I'm the caregiver and I'm, I'm help, I do most of the uh, medical research for my husband. His, his issue with Fulferinox was the oxaliplatin because of the neuropathy Neuropath. and the, the cold sensitivity. So, but doesn't Abraxane sort of have the same side effects with the neuropathy? And if not, you sub, yeah, go ahead. Not as severe, one. And two, okay. lower the dose. I mean, the recommended dose okay. for Abraxane is 125 per meter squared. So the mm -hmm. average dose is going to be 170 to 200 milligrams. It's just as effective if you give it at 80, 90, or 100 milligrams. If you lower the doses, you'll reduce the side effects, and you won't okay. decrease efficacy. Do, do you, I, I've read a lot about this low dose, um, and it makes, it makes a lot of sense to me, and I'm not even a doctor. Um, how do we, how would you recommend patients approaching their oncologists about this? Uh, do, do, do they know about it? Do they know about this dose, this low dose schedule? Um, you know, or do, would they just do it? Um, <laughs> right. Mo again, most oncologists, and, and I tell this to every patient I see, if you went to UCLA, Stanford, MD Anderson, or Sloan Kettering, uh -huh. they all follow the guidelines. Uh, and if the patient is young and fit, they'll all pick Fulfurinox. The yes. irony is that they get Fulfurinox for one dose, and then everybody modifies it. So they're not following the guidelines. And mm -hmm. I know this for a fact, the Mayo Clinic, most of the time, in the initial dosing, leaves out one of the drugs to make sure it gets tolerated. They well, leave the arenotecan, and then they add the arenotecan 
at 50% dose. So the, the truth husband. is, yep. if, if you audited all of these patients, I would say no one is getting the guidelines, period. That's so but interesting. Yet, My husband is Everyone already... is pounding, pounding the yes. desktop. Yes. Use yes. the guidelines. Use the guidelines. Yeah, my husband's already off of, he's now doing full theory. He, he, they took the um, oxalop, oxaloplatin oh, out of yeah. his chemo. Yeah. And now he's just doing full theory and they're just hoping to get mileage out of full theory. Um, well, so. a question I could ask, it's not a good question. What's the mm -hmm. data where someone has been on fulfurinox and they, uh, stop using the oxali, what, what is the data if you put people on full fury? Right, right. The answer is, I don't know. Um, hmm. Most of the time there is data for, uh, well, anyway. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So they're giving um, drugs that are widely used that have been approved it seems logical, but um, it's reasonable to do. My feeling is you should do whatever you're doing and do it in a way that's well tolerated and safe. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there, do you have a publication that would be helpful for if I wanted to bring this to my oncologist to take a look at and consider? Sure. You can... Would, uh, um, if you give the Hirschberg people, if you give Amy your email, uh -huh. you can email you a manuscript. Okay. You can do okay. it you can call later. Get her email. We'll, we will email you a manuscript. Okay. Um, yeah, Wonderful. we can send out that information. Um, Dr. Isakoff, I have a couple more questions that have Thank come you. in via the Zoom chat. Sorry. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, yeah. These these webinars are amazing. Wonderful. We will be in touch with more information. And this, okay. again, the recording will be made available after okay. um, if you missed anything or want to go back. Um, so Dr. Isakoff, we had a couple questions come in via the chat. And one was from Martin who said, I see that angiogenesis inhibitors have potentially serious side effects. Can you cover how and if this treatment mitigates these side effects? The side effects are um, primarily hypertension and also sometimes uh, some kidney dysfunction. So obviously with the blood pressure, you monitor it. Uh, if the blood pressure starts increasing, it's okay to use anti-hypertensive medicine. For the kidneys, uh, you should check creatinine uh, on a regular basis, probably every other week. Uh, and also check the urine uh, to look for protein in the urine. And if you monitor the blood pressure closely and Look at the urine and the creatinine. It's very safe medicine to use. Okay. Um, uh, I, I wanted I want to make sure Julie gets her question in. Julie Lop, your um, your patient from 15 years, Dr. Isakoff. Uh, she was asking yesterday uh, two questions. One, could you comment about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her return of pancreatic cancer uh, and survival? And the second question. Uh, how often does uh, pancreatic cancer return and the treatment the second time around? Um, well, what was the first question? First question, uh, please comment about Ruth Bader Ginsburg oh. and her return of pancreatic cancer and survival. Well, I mean, uh, I don't know the details about her cancer. Uh, she did have a Whipple uh, initially. Now it's in her liver. Uh, I'm not sure of the drug she's using, nor I, do I know the physician's 
treating her. Of course, we all wish her well, uh, but the likelihood of recurrence after a Whipple is really directly dependent on whether the nodes were involved or whether or not there was lymphovascular or perineural invasion. So the patients that have the lowest probability of recurrent disease are node negative patients after Whipple and those patients without lymphovascular invasion or perineural invasion. Um, now that Ruth Bader Ginsburg has recurred, she, they are faced with a dilemma. And the dilemma is she's elderly uh, and she's physically probably in good shape, but how aggressive do you wanna be in treating her uh, she will never tolerate full dose fulfurinox. I think fulfurinox for her would be a great choice if they lowered all the doses. It's, it'll still work. But I really don't know what she's getting. We all wish her well. Uh, and her recurrence is based on the status of her nodes when they did the Whipple. We have a couple more questions from the chat. Um, one is from Allison who writes, my brother is on Gemzar Abraxane for pancreatic cancer. He has been on this cocktail for two months, I believe. His CA199 number was in the thousands and now is less than a hundred. Do you think he might be a surgical candidate now or is his cancer going into remission? It's a great question. Uh, so you're gonna get my personal perspective, it's not standard of care. Uh, it sounds like he has locally advanced, unresectable, non-metastatic disease. Mm -hmm. And most oncologists would recommend three or four months of therapy. And then if he becomes a surgical candidate, go to surgery. The prognosis, as I alluded to before, uh, long-term is based on the nodes. So if he went to surgery tomorrow and the nodes were negative, prognosis is good. If they're positive, it's not so good. The question is, if you prolong the duration of treatment pre-op, do you convert node positivity to node negativity? And the answer is yes. Uh, I looked at my data over the last 20 years, and we divided the patients into three groups. One group that got pre-op chemotherapy for less than six months. The uh, second group that got treatment between six and 12 months. And the third group that actually got chemotherapy for 12 months or longer. The group that had the by far longest survival the ones that got it for 12 months or longer, they had the highest uh, incidence of node negativity and the longest survival. The shortest was six, less than six months. So for me, it's if you, the longer you treat, there's a direct correlation with node negativity and node negativity correlates with survival. It actually triples survival. Wonderful. I think one of the biggest questions that seem to be coming up in the comments, and I apologize, everyone, I'm trying to get to all of your questions. Um, but I think the biggest one that I've seen is sort of how can patients advocate for themselves and advocate for this sort of metronomic dosing that you're talking about? Um, well, uh, again, anyone that wants you can, you can look, Google metronomic dosing for uh, chemotherapy. Um, you can Google it for pancreatic cancer or any other cancer. And that way you'll have some knowledge as to the experience that others have had. Uh, you can call Amy and we're happy, or I can, uh, actually I can get Amy's, um, email 
give her a copy of a an article that uses metronomic dosing and she can forward it to you or whoever wants it. Yeah, my email is amy, A-M-Y, at pancreas. I have, I have your email. No, I'm giving it to everyone else too, Dr. Azikoff. Oh. Amy, amy at pancreatic.org. And that's also in the chat. Um, sorry, there was one early on question. Do you have a few more minutes to answer some of these questions, Dr. Isaacoff? Sure. Okay, so Deanne Leibowitz asked, um, can you address new developments in the chemo concoctions for advanced cholangiosarcoma? No. Angiosarcoma. I'm guessing for an that... angiosarcoma, uh, not not real. I mean, it's a whole. Uh, it, it, it's completely different. No, there, there are angiosarcomas that start in the connective tissue of uh, the pancreas, but it's a specialty unto itself and those kind of tumors should be treated by experts that treat uh, mesenchymal tumors or sarcomas. So it's a whole field of uh, expertise treating sarcomas. Okay, so we will reach out with some more specific information. Um, another question was, can you go into a little bit of the difference between the metronomic dosing and chronomodulation therapy? That's interesting. Who came up with chronomodulated therapy? That is Christina. Thank oh. you, Christina. Okay, Christina. <laughs> uh, it turns <laughs> Actually, my, my wife and I talk about chronomodulation almost every day. Sounds strange. But we have a plant <laughs> in our living room that in the morning is wide open. And in, at nighttime, it closes up. And, and I said it, it has a biorhythm, and it, it's called chronomodulation. She thinks I'm crazy, but it's true. Uh, it turns out that uh, one example of... Uh, biological rhythms, or what we call circadian rhythms, uh, has to do with 5-FU. And the enzyme that breaks down 5-FU has a circadian rhythm. It's greatest at night, usually between 10 and 2 in the morning, and lowest in, in, the, in, you know, in the morning, like at 8, 9, 10 o'clock. So there was a French oncologist. Uh, his name was Francois, and I'm blocking his last name. But he gave all his chemotherapy by a circadian pump, mm -hmm. meaning that 80% of the dose of 5-FU was given between 10 o'clock at night and 2 in the morning and 20% was given the rest of the time. And it turned out when he gave the medicine that way, he had the least toxicity from 5-FU, and he never had to stop the 5-FU or never had to delay the treatment of the next cycle. And if you look at his data from colon cancer going back to the 90s and in the early 2000s, uh, his toxicity is just about zero, and he has the highest response rates for Francois Levy is his name, the highest response rates for treating colon cancer. Um, and in the beginning, I used to send patients to France to get on his circadian pumps until mm. we started using them here. But the truth of the matter is that it has the least side effects and actually the best outcome. So it means that you give, uh, there's a rhythm to the way you give the chemotherapy. And uh, it's, it's almost like a sign curve. Um, but Google Francois Levy 
and circadian chemotherapy. He pioneered a lot of it in France. Okay. When and he uses low doses, and again, it's it's under the uh, aegis, if you will, or the same philosophical thinking of the least toxicity has the best results. Wonderful. Um, Monica asked if you could elaborate on the benefits of vitamin C infusions with your protocol. Uh, yes. Uh, there's a lot of phony vit vitamin C out there. However, the director of the Comprehensive Cancer Center at Cornell, um, I'm blocking his name, but he came from Harvard. He's a brilliant researcher, has studied vitamin C. And it turns out when you give high dose vitamin C by infusion, okay, it's an oxidant. It turns out to generate what we call oxidative species. Cancer hates oxidative species and it may interfere with uh, the ability of the cancer to generate energy uh, on one hand but also it develops these oxidative species that cancer just doesn't like and so theoretically if you're getting chemotherapy the chemotherapy damages DNA. And what the cell wants to do is repair the DNA. And the vitamin C, he thinks, uh, Luke Cantley is his name, Google Cantley, C-A-N-T-L-E-Y, Lewis Cantley. He's done amazing work on vitamin C. So when you have vitamin C on board, it may interfere with the utilization of energy and it may impact how the cancer repairs its DNA after chemotherapy. Wonderful, thank you for that. I think most, do you have a couple more minutes? We've got some more questions. I'm, I'm fine. Okay. I heard I was getting paid by the question. Okay, exactly. Um, Martin, I think, had a follow-up question. He said, or they said, did you say that biologics might work? Why or why not? Did you try to use them with your treatment? And I believe to refresh your memory, Martin had the question about the angiogenesis inhibitors and their side effects. Biologics are interesting. Um, the answer is yes, it depends on how you use them. Uh, for example, there's a drug called uh, tolicizumab. Uh, it's used to treat arthritis and it actually blocks IL-6, which is a inflammatory cytokine, which is bad for cancer. Uh, so it's basically in the setting of chronic inflammation. So some of these immune uh, cytokines actually stimulate cancer and some of these biologics inhibit those cytokines, uh, inhibit the cytokines. Another drug a biologic is vitamin D. When pancreatic cancer becomes pancreatic cancer, it activates fibroblasts. Activated fibroblasts also secretes cytokines that keep your immune cells away. The vitamin D uh, causes activated fibroblasts to revert back to normal fibroblasts so they don't make these bad cytokines and your immune system can now function locally the way it's supposed to. But, uh, you know, there are just so many biologics now that, to, to, and they're, they're all going into trials. 
So I think they're relatively non-toxic uh, and they're very easy to add to conventional therapy. Um, my, my guess is they'll be um, more widely used in the next few years, but uh, many of them are uh, drugs that target specific um, pathologic mutations. Uh, we all know about Limparza and the BRCA mutations, but we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. Uh, I don't know. I would not use the biologics by themselves. I think they would work better with low dose regular cytotoxic drugs. So all of the drugs are used with, again, uh, safety. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, Amy is going to receive your questions and she'll try and help address them one-on-one, -on -one, but we're going to let Dr. Isakov go. Um, Aggie, I'm going to turn the stage over to you. I, I am absolutely am amazed, Dr. Isakoff, how, how informative and how wonderful this was uh, for all of us. It's, it was Aggie, you could still call me Bill. <laughs> I, wanted to be, I wanted to be polite. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, it was absolutely, absolutely a wonderful, comprehensive presentation. Everything was answered. And it's funny because I was also thinking this morning of your mentorship of me in, in 1997, how many hours and questions <laughs> you took uh, with, with, with ease to lead me to realize that, that I can in fact help uh, patients and advance um, research by forming the foundation. And, and, and I, I, only the people in the foundation know it's not only the scientists you fund, but how directly, personally you're involved with taking care of the patients. You definitely make sure they get to the right place. And Listen. that is invaluable. <laughs> okay, you taught me well, that, that's the end. And without your guidance, you know, we wouldn't be here today. But I also wanted to thank the guests. Uh, there, there were so many faces I've seen and so many new faces. It's wonderful to have you. Um, welcome to the Hirschberg Foundation. Um, I would also like to say in closing that we have um, our 21st, 23rd uh, LA Cancer Challenge coming up, up, up October 25th. It's going to be a virtual event and we have lots of fun planned if you can believe it and email details will be sent to you uh, very shortly. Bill, you are a blessing. That's all I can say. Thank you. You're a blessing. Have Thanks, a good everyone. Week. Thank you all. Again, this will be, uh, this has been recorded and will be made available to you. So thank you all so much for joining us. Hi, Deborah. I see you. Uh, hi, hi, Lee. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love seeing you.